Thank you for coming. Please be seated. I am pleased to welcome Michael Zuckert to the St. John's community. Professor Zuckert is the Nancy Reeves Drew Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame. He has been the chair of the Political Science Department there several times and is now the head of the Tocqueville Center for the Study of Religion in American Public Life. Professor Zuckert is the founder and editor of the journal American Political Thought and has received multiple awards for his teaching and for a lifetime of scholarship. Michael is no stranger to liberal arts education. He taught for many years at Carleton College, as well as Cornell, Chicago, Claremont, Michigan, and Fordham. His thinking is extraordinarily wide ranging. He's published extensively on a variety of topics, including, but not limited to, George Orwell, Plato, Shakespeare, and contemporary liberal theory. He has been called one of America's most eminent scholars of American political thought and constitutional studies. In a series of books, Natural Right and the New Republicanism, The Natural Rights Republic, and Launching Liberalism, Professor Zuckert has explored his profound interest in natural right and its connection to Republican government. He is currently finishing a new book entitled Completing the Constitution, The Post-Civil War Amendments. Professor Zuckert thinks deeply about what self-government means, and I'm sure we'll get a taste of the depth this evening. His talk tonight is entitled, Thinking About Lincoln. Please welcome Professor Michael Zuckert. I want to thank Sarah for that kind, generous introduction. It always sets too high a bar, you know, but uh, I'll try to do what I can. Um, at a time like this, when the governor of a state with a historically prominent state university system thinks that the universities in his state should no longer set seeking the truth as one of their goals um, and should substitute instead preparing students to enter the job market and fill the labor force of the state. It is a great honor to be here at St. John's. This is an institution of higher learning that stands as a reminder of what education actually is about and serves, or at least it should serve, to embarrass those responsible for American universities who seem to have lost track of what education is for. It is a pleasure as well as an honor to be part of the St. John's enterprise, even if in this relatively small uh, uh, bit. Now my topic, as announced, is thinking about Lincoln. And I've chosen my title not merely for its poetic qualities, although I think that's those aren't lacking, but because it points us in the right direction on Lincoln. He supplies matter for thinking beyond any other figure of our national life. Something of why this is so, I think, is uh, suggested by another president, Woodrow Wilson, who on the 100th anniversary of Lincoln's birth asked his audience the following. Have you ever looked at one of those singular statues of the great French sculptor Rodin. Those pieces of marble in which only some part of a figure is revealed and the rest is left in the hidden lines of the marble itself. Here there emerges the arm and the bust and the eager face, but the body disappears in the general bulk of the stone and the lines fall off vaguely. These sculptures reminded Wilson of Lincoln. As he said, there was a little disclosed of him, but not all. You feel that more remained unrevealed than was disclosed to our view. He is like some great reservoir of living water, which you can freely quaff, but can never exhaust. My sense of Lincoln is very like this. The more we come to understand him, the more there seems yet to be understood. One is never sure one has seen to the bottom of him, rather, one is almost sure one hasn't. Yet it seems to me that we are not thinking as much of Lincoln as we once did, or thinking as well of him either. I mean by the first claim, not only that we don't think as often, but also not as well. I mean by the second claim, not only that we don't think as highly, but we don't think as wisely, or one might say thoughtfully, as Americans once did. 
In that same essay that I quoted from before, Woodrow Wilson said of Lincoln, it is not necessary that I should rehearse for you the life of Abraham Lincoln. It has been written in every school book. It has been rehearsed in every family. It were to impeach your intelligence to tell you the story of his life. Today, I doubt that we can say what Wilson said, that Lincoln's life is rehearsed in every family. And while he does still appear, obviously, in school books and in movies, it is not in so positive a way as in Wilson's day. Of course, Lincoln has not fallen to the level of, say, Jimmy Carter or Herbert Hoover in the estimate of the American people. It is rather that we now have a profoundly ambiguous relation to Lincoln. He still receives great honor, as for example, in the ratings of the great presidents. He is often rated number one, or at least number two, but usually number one. Nonetheless, we must note that these are polls of presidency scholars for the most part. And their criteria of judgment tend to focus on the strength which, which the different presidents have exercised the powers of their office, which is, I think, a narrow measure at best of a statesman. Certain reservations, in some cases serious reservations, have now spread about Lincoln among both scholars and I think the general public. Actually, there have been two major waves of reconsideration of Lincoln corresponding roughly to the two halves of the 20th century. The first of them was sponsored by some of the great historians of the Civil War, and they came to consider or reconsider Lincoln's statecraft in particular, especially as he practiced it in the pre-Civil War period. Their criticism of Lincoln goes something like this. He took an overly radical and overly moralistic position in the pre-war period, and together with the abolitionists and some of his Republican Party allies, he transformed a conflict that could have been compromised and settled in a peaceful way, and he turned it into a situation with all the earmarks of a Greek tragedy. The Civil War, these historians say, was not inevitable in itself, <clears throat> but Lincoln and his friends made it so by their intransigence. Lincoln famously had said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe, he went on, this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. These historians believe that Lincoln, by pronouncing and acting on the principles of this house divided speech, created the situation and the climate of opinion in which the entire South could do naught but see his election as a declaration of war against them and against their institutions. And thus, the historians go on, the South felt they had no choice but to leave the Union when he was elected. At the same time, Lincoln um, insisted that he, he did not expect the Union to be dissolved. He did not expect the House to fall but he did expect that it will cease to be divided. So what Lincoln stated here as a mere prediction was for him an imperative of policy, and he was resolved not to allow the disillusion of the Union. So we have a case where the now unstoppable force of Lincoln-inspired fear in the South met the immovable object of, Lincoln's resolve, of Lincolnian resolve to maintain the Union and once the issue was defined this way, the result was inevit as inevitable as the denouement of a Greek tragedy, the Civil War. This line of argument about the Civil War and Lincoln became powerful during the first half of the 20th century and was associated in the mind of historians and of the general public, I think, uh, with a more broad scale national reassessment of the end result of that war. The segregation system replaced slavery in the South, while Northern opinion lost all real zeal for uh, any sort of civil rights agenda, any zeal for remaking Southern society, um, uh, or for attending to sectionally divisive issues of any sort. The idea was there was, there was a desire to avoid any issues that would interfere with the um, geometric rate of growth of the economy in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Reading backwards from the national accommodation to the peculiar racial patterns in the South, Americans began to wonder whether the Civil War 
up until World War I, the most destructive war in human history, Americans began to wonder whether the Civil War had been worth it. The historians, breathing in the spirit of their age, redefined the war as preventable, with Lincoln and the abolitionists as the chief villains in snatching war from the jaws of peace. Now, historians varied a good deal in the motivation that they attributed to Lincoln for his actions here. Some of them thought it was just an instance of poor judgment. For example, that he didn't understand the real dynamics of slavery expansion, a topic I'll speak of a little bit further later. Or that he didn't understand what kind of war it would actually be. At the outbreak of fighting, for example, Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to serve a three-month enlistment. To put these numbers in some sort of perspective, recall that the Civil War left nearly 620,000 dead on both sides. And that was four years later, not three months. Others see the entire episode even less favorably to Lincoln. One very famous essay by a very well-known historian was called Abraham Lincoln and the Self-Made Myth. And in this essay, this historian attributed all of Lincoln's actions to nothing so much as his soaring personal ambition. The argument was that Lincoln was willing to risk all, to risk the future of the country and the lives of his countrymen so that he might hold high office. Ironically, the charges raised against Lincoln in the second round of reassessments in the second half of the 20th century are more or less the opposite of what were raised against him in the first round. Not Lincoln's intransigence, but his half-heartedness, the narrowness of his motives, of his actions and views, the deep conservatism of all that he did and thought were the new targets. This line of thought about Lincoln emerged in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement. Lincoln, these critics insist, may have signed the document that freed the slaves, but he didn't much like black people, did not want to free slaves, favored the interests of whites only, and did not see America as a place for whites and blacks to live in together. In the final analysis, these charges amount to the dread accusations of racism, conservatism. He frequently spoke of his reverence for the fathers of our country. Um, and also, I haven't mentioned it yet, but pro-capitalism, because he frequently spoke of the virtues of free markets. The two sets of charges are rather serious. On the one hand, Lincoln is held to be drastically deficient in his statecraft, that is politically def defective. In the other case, he's held to be deficient morally. Together, they surely help account for why we're not thinking about Lincoln either so often or so highly as, he, as people once did. Now, my task this evening is to speculate, not really to speculate on the uh, relative decline in Lincoln's uh, cosmic approval ratings, but to think a bit, partly defend, and partly just to ruminate on Lincoln and his thoughts and actions. I'd like to deal with the various charges against him in terms of this question. Was Lincoln right, or was Stephen A. Douglas right in their great debates? The debate between them concerned a very simple question. What should national policy be with respect to the presence or absence of slavery in the territories belonging to the United States that were not yet states. Before I discuss this, let me interject one editorial comment. Read these debates. I don't know, are they part of the curriculum here, the Lincoln-Douglas debates? Yes, they are. So most of the audience will have read them or read some of them anyway. Well, anyway, I'll go on with my editorial because some people may not have read them in the audience. But these debates can show what democratic politics in America once was capable of. Here we had two candidates traveling the length and breadth of the state of Illinois, speaking on the topics that they, and not a panel of reporters, thought were important, speaking at length, speaking with humanity, with logic, with cutting sarcasm, and often obtrusive civility, in speeches that were jammed with information and with history and with explanations of alternative policies and with reflections about political morality and right. Here was an election campaign in which the candidates treated what was really a half-educated electorate 
an electorate that turned out in droves and sat for three or four, sometimes five hours. These candidates treated these people as intelligent, informed, or at least capable of being informed, and capable of judging for themselves about the most important issues facing them as citizens. I'm not going to pause to make the obvious comparison to the electioneering candidates, the electorate in our time. Now, so in these debates, each candidate stood for one policy. Douglas for the policy of territorial self-determination or what he liked to call popular sovereignty. Lincoln stood for the prohibition of slavery in the territories, at least in those territories which, uh, uh, which were north of the old Missouri Compromise Line. Now, Douglas's policy of popular sovereignty was actually a brilliant solution to an intractable problem of politics, both high and low. His policy itself was actually rather simple. Instead of having Congress decide whether slavery would or would not be allowed to go into these territories, as had been the approach taken since 1787 in the Northwest Ordinance, instead of that, Douglas proposed that the people of each territory should be allowed to settle this question for themselves. This issue was especially important because if slavery was allowed to enter one of these territories, the state that would be carved out of it would almost, well, no, I would say inevitably, not just almost, would inevitably enter the Union as a slave state. And if slavery were kept out at, in its territorial phase, this, this territory would inevitably enter the Union as a free state. So the status of slavery in the territories was extraordinarily important for the future of that territory. Now, given the way that representation in the Senate works and the role of senatorial rep uh, representation in the Electoral College, the relative number of free and slave states was a matter of central importance to all sections of the country. Therefore, the strongest political passions were brought to bear on Congress in its attempts to deal with the issue of slavery in the territories all of national politics was caught up more or less all the time in this sectional conflict, and that conflict was explosive. Now, Douglas's solution was elegant. The principle of America, he says, is self-government. Therefore, let the people of each territory govern themselves, decide for themselves whether they want to have slavery or not. Why should Washington dictate a solution? It's beginning to sound a little familiar, isn't it? Douglas thought he, that he had found a way to settle what appeared to be a union-threatening conflict. The center of conflict would no longer be Washington, but it would be all out there in the local territories. The question of whether to allow slavery in any given territory would no longer involve the entire Congress and the president. It was a masterful effort to deflect and disarm conflict. It managed to avoid what was becoming the most contentious ele uh, element of this conflict as well. Because for Congress to make a pronouncement on the subject amounted to a national endorsement of the principles and institutions of one or the other section of the country and implicitly represented a rejection of the institutions and principles of the other section. Since Congress in the past in its legislation had forbidden slavery in the territories, in the north of the uh, uh, Missouri Compromise Line, the Southerners felt as though their special institutions and values were being disvalued by the nation. The South felt slighted and demanded that its institutions be recognized as equally valuable. Now, Douglas's popular sovereignty policy gave the South at least some of what it wanted here. If not national endorsement of slavery, which is what they most wanted, then at least a cessation of the implicit national condemnation of slavery, which was at least halfway to where they wanted to be. Under Douglas's popular sovereignty policy, the federal government is to remain strictly neutral between northern principles of freedom and southern principle of slavery. As Douglas frequently said when he was out on the hustings, he didn't care. He didn't care whether slavery was voted up or down, just that it be voted on. For Douglas, 
actually was not so personally neutral as these public statements uh, suggested. He did not particularly, we believe this is true, the evidence is actually slight on this, but uh, we believe it's true, that he did not particularly wish to see slavery spread and thought that his policy would not in fact lead to that result. He believed that slavery took root or not, not because of laws, but because of physical conditions. That some climates and the resulting agricultural economy that could emerge there were suited to slavery and some climates were not. Nature, he said, not law, would decide where slavery would go, and thus the divisive political battles could be avoided in a way that made no difference to the ultimate outcome. Now, Douglas's position, as I hope you can see, was a statesmanly position. It aimed to promote political peace and harmony and to avoid both the scylla of disunion and the threat, the charybdis, of civil war that the nation seemed to face in the 1850s. No wonder some historians came to condemn Lincoln for intransigently framing the issue in such a way as to prevent Douglas's specific and apparently humane policy from succeeding. And by doing so, forcing the nation to face the scylla of disunion, i.e. secession, and the charybdis of civil war both. Now thinking well about Lincoln, that is deeply and honestly, requires that we face up to the challenge of Douglas. Now it must be said at the outset that Lincoln did everything in his power to prevent the country from adopting Douglas's policy. He, Lincoln had dropped out of politics in 1850 after one term in Congress. He had turned his attention more seriously than ever before to his legal practice and he seemed resolved to make his life outside of politics in the private sphere. He was becoming a very successful railroad lawyer at this time. His plans changed in 1854 when the Kansas-Nebraska Act made Douglas's popular sovereignty policy of prohibiting slavery outright in these territories, um, uh, sorry, when, it, when they adopted the popular sovereignty in place of the Missouri Compromise policy. Lincoln's change of direction at this moment was remarkable. He started to research the history of the slavery question in America, and he turned back to politics, um, not as before, oriented around sort of petty partisan politics, which he had mostly been involved with before, um, uh, but dedicated instead to one object. And that was to show the perniciousness of the Douglas policy and the corresponding, as he put it, propriety of the restoration of the Missouri Compromise. Lincoln insisted that the question of substantive principle, that is the question of the inherent right or wrongness of slavery, could not be pushed aside in favor of the procedural solution of the popular sovereignty policy. Now this may seem the obviously right answer, but we can't rest so easy with it. Conceding that Lincoln is correct about the moral evil of slavery, it's still a fact that he was not about to change the minds of the slaveholders or their allies. Moreover, he was far from an abolitionist himself. He conceded that despite the moral wrong of slavery, only the states where it existed could do anything about it. And he knew that they were not about to do anything about it anytime soon. It is not at all clear then that any good would follow from Lincoln's policy, but it certainly was clear to Douglas anyway that much political evil would follow, an intensified return to all the political conflict um, uh, preceding 1854. So Lincoln's position, in other words, could be seen as quite irresponsible. Now in 1854, in a speech addressed against Douglas, Lincoln explicitly and very lucidly explained why he left his lucrative law practice and took it upon himself to speak out against the leading politician in Illinois, and indeed one of the two or three leading politicians in the entire nation. It was because he tells us, I hate this declared indifference to the spread of slavery. Hatred, pretty strong sentiment from a man who at the end of a war produced a lot of hatred all around the country, uh, called for malice toward none and charity for all. 
Lincoln hated the Douglas policy of indifference to slavery and came out, out of retirement, to voice that hatred and to try to make others feel it also. And here's what he said. He said, I hate, I hate it, he said, because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world. And especially I hate it because it forces so many good men amongst ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principle of civil liberty, criticizing the Declaration of Independence and insisting that there is no right principle of action but self-interest. So Lincoln hates Douglass's policy for its effects on three different groups. First, for its effects on the slaves themselves as victims of the monstrous injustice of slavery. Second, on those foreigners who are enemies to America deep down and enemies to republicanism and who are heartened by the existence of slavery in the midst of alleged freedom. Um, uh, it, it was said to prove the hypocrisy of the Americans. Um, there's a very famous example of a, of a European um, critic of America at the time, of, actually, of the American Revolution, Samuel Johnson, the famous dictionary writer and novelist and raconteur. Um, Samuel Johnson said at the time of the American Revolution, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? And third, and finally, Lincoln hates the effects uh, of uh, Douglass's policy on many good men amongst ourselves. It leads them, he said, into opposition to the Declaration of Independence and the principles of political right. Perhaps surprisingly, Lincoln identified this last as, the most, uh, as, as, as his most special ground for hating the Douglass policy. Lincoln was definitely onto something when he saw slavery as turning many men against the Declaration of Independence. Senator Pettit, I'm embarrassed to say, the senator from my home, current home state of Indiana, in 1854, on the floor of the Senate, called the Declaration of Independence a self-evident lie, an indication of its losing certain credibility. From Lincoln's point of view, perhaps the most discouraging sign of the war that slavery provoked against the Declaration of Independence was the decision by the U.S. Supreme Court in the famous or actually infamous case, uh, the Dred Scott case. There, the Chief Justice of the United States said that the Declaration of Independence could not possibly have been meant to apply to members of the African race, who he concluded, this is a direct quotation, had no rights which the white man is bound to respect. This is the fulfillment to a T of what Lincoln was, had feared three years earlier in 1854, that good men would reject the very principles of political right and instead insist that there is no right principle of action but self-interest. Now, all three of Lincoln's points, all three of the target audiences he was worried about, end up being variants of his first point, that Douglass's policy ignores the monstrous injustice of slavery. It is this injustice that robs American institutions of their power of example in the world, and it is this injustice that threatens to rob America of its own commitment to right principles of political action. Lincoln's point here is a bit more subtle than it might seem. It is not slavery itself that does these bad things as much as the Douglas approach to slavery. That is to say, the Douglas Declaration of Official Indifference to its rightness or wrongness. Lincoln thought slavery a monstrous injustice, but he thought that it would have to be lived with for the time being, and that it could be lived with, so long as the prohibition on the spread of slavery remained in the law to serve two crucial purposes. First, to affirm the inherent wrong of slavery by not being neutral about it, and second, to give the public mind reason to believe that slavery was, as Lincoln used to put it, in course of ultimate extinction. <laughs> in that second wave of criticism, after the start of the Civil Rights Movement, Lincoln was blamed for being so tolerant of slavery as this, blamed for uh, 
opposing intransigently and immediately, not the evil itself, but the peripheral matter of the spread of the evil, all the while affirming his willingness to tolerate the evil where it existed. Now, Lincoln apparently hated Douglass's indifference about slavery even more than he hated the evil of slavery. But we can understand his reasons for opposing Douglass's effort as a states, at a statesmanly settlement, as well as his reasons for not going further in an abolitionist direction, only if we listen carefully to what he says about the monstrous injustice of <laughs> slavery itself. His central argument against slavery is actually a very simple syllogism. And I know that here at St. John's you've studied syllogisms, so you're, you're ready for this, I'm sure. The first premise of his syllogism is like this. All human beings are equal, or as he sometimes put it, possess equal rights, or as he also sometimes put it, possess rights to themselves. I think he saw those as equivalent formulations. Premise two, the blacks are human beings. Conclusion, therefore slavery of the blacks or of any human being is unjust because it is a denial of rights, a denial of the rights of self-ownership. Lincoln, as you can see, was no relativist, that is clear. He did not believe that it was merely his value judgment that slavery was wrong. Rather, he insisted it is wrong, and a decent political society needs to recognize that. But Lincoln also knew that not everyone accepted his syllogism. In particular, the first premise had become very controversial in his time, as I've already maybe suggested to you. What then is Lincoln's argument in favor of his first premise? Actually, he made three chief arguments for universal human equality and against slavery. The first argument was probably the most common one, and it's the one he, it's the one he used most often, and it was an argument from feeling, an argument from feeling. He told his audience in 1854, this is what he said, your sense of justice and your human sympathy continually tell you that the poor Negro has some natural right to himself. Later, same speech, he says, repeal the Missouri Compromise. Repeal all compromises. Repeal the Declaration of Independence. Repeal all past history. You still cannot repeal human nature. It still will be the abundance of man's heart that slavery extension is wrong. It is certain, he asserted, that the great mass of mankind considers slavery a great moral wrong, and their feeling against it is not evanescent, but eternal. It lies at the very foundation of their sense of justice. So nature, nature as expressed in the universal or near universal promptings of the human heart teaches that human beings are equal and that slavery is an abomination. That's Lincoln's first argument in favor of his first premise. Nature is not the only source of this knowledge for Lincoln, however. He goes on, my ancient faith, my ancient faith teaches me that all men are created equal and that there can be no moral right in connection with one man's making a slave of another. By his ancient faith, Lincoln means, of course, the Declaration of Independence. This is a statement not universally known and delivered by or into the human heart in the natural feelings, but rather a proposition put forward in a specifically American document. It is Lincoln's or our faith as a people, not the faith of mankind in general. Where Lincoln's first argument appeals to universal nature, his second argument appeals to history to a particular deliverance of our history. Now these two arguments, perhaps not contradictory to each other, but still are quite different. Now to these two arguments, Lincoln adds a third, and that's very different from the others. Where the others are in one form or another sub-rational arguments, appeals to feelings or to faith, this one is a rational argument. This is Lincoln. If A can prove, however conclusively, that he may of right enslave B, why may not B 
snatch the same argument and prove equally that he may enslave A. You say A is white and B is black. It is color then. The lighter having the right to enslave the darker, is that it? Take care. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with a fairer skin than your own. Oh, you don't mean color exactly. You mean that whites are intellectually the superiors of the blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them. Take care again. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. But, say you, it is a question of interest, and if you can make it your interest, you have the right to enslave another. Very well, and if he can make it his interest, he has the right to enslave you. Now this, again, is in a way a very simple argument, yet I think it's a very powerful argument. It's what in some contemporary moral philosophy is called an agent relative argument. It begins with a claim that I, each and every I, raise for myself or for ourselves. I feel, I know in my bones, my own claim to freedom and that I am free and that I demand to be free. I cannot help but see this and assert this claim for myself. And Lincoln's reasoning makes me see that I cannot go on to affirm the enslaving of another without endangering in principle my own freedom. To affirm slavery for another is to affirm slavery for oneself. As Lincoln said in another place, although volume upon volume is written to prove slavery a very good thing, we never hear of the man who wishes to take the good of it by being a slave himself. Or put even more simply, Lincoln once said, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. Now, as you may have noticed, this argument also contains an important premise rooted in feeling. And in this respect, it is like Lincoln's first argument, the argument from feeling. But there's an important difference between the two. In the first argument, the so-called universal feeling is a direct revulsion against the slavery of others. In this third argument, it is a direct revulsion against the slavery of oneself. Now, Lincoln is on much solider ground and knows that he is in affirming the universality of the latter feeling than of the former. After all, as he concedes, volume and volume have been written to justify the slavery of others, but no one willingly chooses this state for himself. In a word, Lincoln's third or rational argument is much better as an argument, as a matter of logic, as a matter of clear thinking, Lincoln proves that one can accept slavery for another only on pain of self-contradiction. Yet Lincoln knows that human beings do not consider the pain of self-contradiction to be the worst pain that they might suffer. He once sat down to consider the case of the very reverend Dr. Ross of Alabama. Dr. Ross was a slaveholder a conscientious man of God who came to ask himself the question whether his slave should be a slave in the eyes of God. Dr. Ross, Lincoln tells us, could receive no direct and unambiguous answer from the Bible and certainly never bothered to ask his slaves what their opinion was. So, and then Lincoln, this is a quotation now. So at last it comes to this, that Dr. Ross is to decide this question himself. And while he considers it, he sits in the shade with gloves on his hands and subsists on the bread that his slaves are earning in the burning sun. If he decides that God wills these slaves free, he thereby has to walk out of the shade, throw off his gloves, and delve for his own bread. Will Dr. Ross, Lincoln asks, will Dr. Ross be actuated by that perfect impartiality which has ever been considered most favorable to correct decisions. Well, the Reverend Ross is more willing to suffer the pain of contradiction than the pain of hard labor in the hot sun. Only if human beings generally found the pain of self-contradiction less tolerable than other pains would rational argument be as conclusive in practice as it is in theory. 
what makes a proposition true and what makes a proposition effective as a maximum of action are in fact quite different things. This is the single most important truth about politics. This disparity sets the task for statesmanship to make the true and the good also the effectual or to bring those elements as close together as possible. This is both what holds politics and morality together and what distinguishes them from each other. This is what separates the tasks of the moral philosopher or the scholarly critics from the political actor of the highest kind. Now, no political actor, in my opinion at least, in American history understood this truth more fully and acted upon it more thoughtfully and creatively than Lincoln did. So to remind you, Lincoln made three arguments against slavery, an argument from direct feeling of revulsion against it, an argument from our faith, and an argument from reason. The argument from reason was true, but as such ineffective. The argument from feeling was effective so far as it was true, that is so far as the feeling was actually, uh, that feeling of revulsion against the slavery brothers was actually felt. Reason ascertains truth, feeling prompts action. But the feeling against slavery for others is fragile. Lincoln knew perfectly well of many who held slaves without revulsion, the Reverend Dr. Ross for one. Reasoning points to the truth of the anti-slavery position, but reasoning is ineffective without the support of feeling, and feeling is unreliable. It is too variable. It is too uncertain in itself. It needs to be formed, focused, and channeled. In this context, Lincoln's other argument against slavery comes into its own, the argument from our ancient faith that is from the American consensus on the Declaration of Independence. The fragility of both reason and feeling points to the need to cultivate fundamental moral and political truth in the mode of faith. Like the ancient faith of God's people, this is our ancient faith, our inheritance from our fathers. Lincoln preaches the universal and rational truth of freedom as the particularistic and sub-rational inheritance of this people and its history. Lincoln attempts to attach the reverence reserved for the most sacred and venerable things to the fundamental truths of political life. The task for Lincoln's statesmanship then is to make the Declaration of Independence an object of an almost religious attachment. He took the truths of John Locke and Thomas Jefferson, two men of the Enlightenment, who thought that rational argument plus self-interest would be enough to produce a decent and true political order. And Lincoln infused their positions, with tr the, their truths, with the spirit of religion and poetry. Now it should be clear, I hope, why Lincoln saw that he had to counter the apparently statesmanly accommodation Douglas was attempting to sell to the nation. Douglas might perhaps gain some temporary political peace, but his policy would endanger the conditions for future political health because it would further wean the nation away from its ancient faith, from its unreflective belief and feelings in favor of universal equality of rights and freedom. Worse than the existence of slavery itself, in other words, is the spreading of the view that slavery is a matter of indifference that the nation can and should be neutral. So long as the moral evil of slavery is reaffirmed, so long as the ancient faith is kept alive, then, Lincoln believed, one could rest secure that the evil would, in time, be abolished from the land. Lincoln knew that his intransigence carried risks, but he thought that the alternative was much worse. He knew also that the disparity between what is true and what is effective meant that in any moment, the one who understands that relation between morality and politics properly must always settle for less than morality, or the abolitionists in this case, demanded. But he must always keep the moral principles alive so that another statesman, another day, might aim at another, a more far-reaching conjunction between the moral truth and the politically efficacious feeling. 
This task is different in detail for each generation, but it remains the task that each generation faces. I can do no better than close out my thinking about Lincoln by quoting, than by quoting his magnificent speech against the Supreme Court's decision in the Dred Scott case. This is a fairly long, but not tediously long passage. The framers, this is Lincoln, the framers of the Declaration of Independence defined with tolerable distinctness in what respect they did consider all men created equal. Equal in certain inalienable rights. This they said and this they meant. They did not mean to assert the obvious untruth that all men were then enjoying that equality, nor yet even that they were about to confer it immediately upon them. In fact, they had no power to confer such a boon. They meant simply to declare the right so that enforcement of it might follow as fast as circumstances should permit. They meant to set up a standard maxim for a free society which could be familiar to all and revered by all, constantly looked up to, constantly labored for, and even though never perfectly attained, constantly approximated, and thereby constantly spreading and deepening its influence and augmenting the happiness and value of life to all people of all colors everywhere. Thank you.